And now, chapter 14 of The Last Boy on Earth, The White Tower. The monster sat in the very depths of what had become his prison. The escape of the two survivors left Grendel full of a new emotion. Where hate and the spit of anger had roiled in his gut before their escape, the backwash of loss and futility rose in his gullet. The sense of sheer helplessness began to whisper into his ear that, alone, he too was vulnerable. He had met her before a thousand times in other times and places, in this world and countless others. She was his antithesis, and arose alongside him, the antiparticle to his particle. He could arise for a while, conquer nations, and devour worlds, but she was always looming in on the horizon. Through her flowed the energy that could destroy him. She was the conduit through which all change would flow, and if she were free to work with the renamer, well, he would need to redouble his efforts to destroy them both before they rose to the apex of their power. How was it that he couldn't bring himself to leave this place and seek them on his own with so much hanging in the balance? If he would move forward and step out into the world, it could be his. What inhibition kept him bound with invisible and adamantine chains from the world that had been created for him? He held his wounded hand and in his crouched position on the cold concrete floor contemplated his failure to destroy the renamer and she who seemed to know his every movement, she who could anticipate his every thought, too implacable for a creature of the quantum state, the interstitial fluctuations that supported every single atom in existence. If summoning the ancient powers of the earth and sky was not enough to destroy them, things were dire, he thought. Nearly everyone on earth had succumbed except for a few. He knew that the boy and the girl weren't alone. Across the globe, a few others had also survived, against all of his planning and morphing throughout the long span of ages through which he had formed. He had been so certain that this time he had coalesced into something entirely deadly to the human race, and he would carry out the purpose for which he was summoned. Now his plan, like a poorly woven cloth, was unraveling in front of his eyes. There was a part of him deeply buried and pushed aside that kept saying, This is wrong. You're wrong. I should have destroyed you. All those people. You truly are a monster. And if I ever escape, I will hunt you down. Who was the owner of this inner voice that lasted never for long and was soon extinguished by other inner voices that whispered other observations? He did not know. Another inner voice said, You're a powerful lord, but you should seek aid from the others. They're waiting for you. They, too, are hungry. And another voice interrupted, If your bite cannot forestall and destroy these men, then surely an army of ones such as yourself would do the trick. Imagine you as their leader. And still another voice from within the depths of his darkness said quietly, Or even better, assimilate them. Make them become part of you. Absorb them as they arrive. Make their weapons your weapons. Their strategies your strategies. You have lost fingers, but you can take their hands, their limbs, their strength, and combine it with your own deep within yourself. It is what you do. And then you will have the courage to leave this building, to seek them out on your own, and then you can proceed to wander the wide world over, hunting the few who have survived. Once the world is clenched, you will surely inherit it. Grendel listened closely to this final voice. Whose voice was it? Was it a doctor's voice? No. A lawyer's voice? Possibly. A politician's voice? Yes, most certainly. A voice suave in the use of power. A slick and sickeningly sweet voice whose dulcet tones predicted success. Grendel liked being told what he wanted to hear. It suited him. He arose from the floor in some discomfort, his hand still throbbing and his wound bounding him. 
He arose from the floor in some discomfort, his hand still throbbing and his wound binding him to his pain, but nothing could stop the juggernaut that he was about to create. He was an inexorable force and had been since the dawn of time lingering just below the fringe of things, waiting and watching. He was the fulcrum upon which all life balanced, a leveler, a gardener who weeded the crops and ripped the weeds from the fertile earth. Tonight, the weeds were two young people hiding from him. Soon, perhaps in a week or a month, he would have the strength to emerge and confront them. He made his way to the medical library on the second floor of the hospital, a place used primarily by the staff before the abandonment. He avoided any place where the ideas and thoughts of humans lingered in books. Books were almost alive with the presence of their human authors, and he could not stand them. It also housed the names of a thousand other monsters whose sustenance had dried up suddenly. They would be hungry, even desperate. He stood in the center of the room and closed his eyes. His mind imagined tunneling downward, ever downward by powers of ten. There, just below the surface of things, was a realm of infinite space and time, an entire universe in the space of an atom, and there even smaller things dwelt, popping into and out of existence. In his mind he journeyed to that minuscule ultima thule underneath and between all things, where dwelt his siblings from long ages ago. He called to them, summoning, Brothers! Sisters! From the depths of my hatred I summon you. From the desolation of the world I cry out to you. Heed my call. I offer you new life. He waited for a reply. Long minutes passed before Grendel began to hear their muffled whispers among themselves, invisible incarnate voices drifting upon the air between the quantum fluctuations. He calls us, the pig, he summoned us. Hungry ass, he survives while we wither. How shall we survive now? Ignore the summons, he will trick you, screamed a high-pitched female voice, ancient beyond years from a great distance. No, no, he's strong. He solely accomplished what we together could not, and I am hungry. He is all we have now. Yes, 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 said a hundred thousand insolent voices from beyond. Grendel waited, but the cacophony grew until even he could stand it no longer. Enough, he shouted. I offer you life and continued existence. Without my offer, you will wither and crumble. No humans to imagine you or nightmares for you to inhabit. What will you do? Your food supply is gone, save for a few. They're not enough to sate your raging hunger. So I offer you something which is better than nothing. There was a long hissing of static and then a long moment. What is your offer? They asked. A simple plan. Join me or perish. The voices of hags and demons, of vampires and trolls, of Jenny Greenteeth and Redcap, all arose in anger. They were thoughts, imagined by people throughout the ages, and now they were living in the borderland, almost totally forgotten except for the weak bonds of those few humans who survived. If those humans all perished, so too would these bogies and ghosts and things that go bump in the night, these infections and diseases and bringers of death. Join you? How is this possible? Do you mean to fight side by side? There is nothing left to attack. You dare invite us to feast, and yet you've already eaten all the food. <laughs> I mean, Grendel said precisely what I have said. Bond with me. Become one with me. Meld with me. Melt my flesh into your flesh. My spirit into yours. Separately you will perish. Only I can survive. Without this last chance you will perish. The humans are dead. He speaks the truth said a saddened voice, coughing and hacking. Perhaps we should <coughs> consider this joining he speaks of. Perhaps it is all that is left. 
Another voice, gasping for breath, muttered, I will submit, I will submit, I do not want to perish, I want to live. As do I, said another and then another. Not all agreed, and many of the voices pronounced their opposition to his plan. But before the hour was done, the majority of his brothers and sisters agreed to this strange bonding he had proposed. Though such combinations had happened before, this was the first time so many had agreed to such a thing. You are an abomination, shouted the old female voice from a distance. I know you. I bore you. I am your mother and you will stop. I call you what you are. You descendant of Cain, first of all murderers. You are natural, should not exist. The boy summoned you in a moment of weakness. He does not know the truth of this, and I would rather perish like all of the people than submit to your will. The boy will beat you. He's better than you. I can do this with or without you, hag, answered Grendel. Any who would not join me know this. I am the undisputed master of this world, this new order. If you're not with me, you're against me. So be it said the old female from a distance. You sicken me, she said. Grendel smiled. Yes, that's what I do. I will have no part of this violation of nature. Those of you who join this creature will rue the day you gave away your souls. It will be a sordid boon indeed, screeched the voice of the hag as it receded into the distance and disappeared. The other voices mingled indeterminate and confused. Good. So it will begin, said Grendel, aloud as he nodded his massive head. The plans were made for the unification of Grendel to his airy brothers and sisters. Their essences would return within a fortnight for the bonding. Grendel needed to gather his own strength to heal before such a thing could be attempted. He knew in the black pit of his own soul that this unification might destroy him. But he was certain that he would perish anyway if he did not attempt it. He left the realm where nightmares go before they dissipate into oblivion and arose back to the world of the Renamer. Alone, his fear of the world was too powerful and made him vulnerable. But with the combined strength of all who had joined him, he would be able to leave the sanctuary of this place, hunt down the survivors, and bring a new world, finally, into play. Brady and Cayley stood at the foot of the Thomas Hill standpipe, a huge white shingled water tower. Inside of the wooden structure, which was by far the tallest one and the highest point in the area, was a tank that held nearly two million gallons of water. The bottom part of the structure was made of quarried stone and was impenetrable. A thick wooden door barred the entrance. It was a solid defensible tower, except that it was made of wood on the outside, and that wood could burn. Brady was pleased to see that it hadn't burned, and this tower, at its placement so high above the rest of the city, was the reason why Brady still had running water in the library, feeding the city on gravity alone. Because of its high position, it was the most visible structure. So, how do we get up there? asked Cayley. There's a winding stairwell all the way to the top. I went up there with my mom a few years ago. It's pretty impressive. I bet you can see half the state from up there. I saw Mount Katahdin when I went up. Should be a good place to check how damaging the fire has been to the city, Kaylee agreed. How are we going to get in? Brady pulled a ring of keys from the lanyard that was attached to his belt and searched for the right one. He found it and held it aloft to her like a musketeer pledging allegiance to his lady. I have the key, he said simply. She was amused. Well, how in the world did you get that? She asked. Brady smiled and looked off in the distance. I'm a thief. You want to know how? Yes, I do, she declared. Well, I had a lot of time on my hands. I explored everywhere. The water tower was run by the Bangor Water Company, so I broke into their offices a few weeks ago looking for um, stuff, and I found this. It was clearly labeled Thomas Hill Standpipe, and it was in the top drawer of the desk in the main office. I shoved it into my backpack and kept moving on. I've got pretty good at breaking into places, but... I prefer to use the keys if they're around. That's smart. Let's see how much of the city's left. The door opened easily, revealing a dark and dusty interior. 
Light from the few small windows lit the narrow wooden stairwell as it wound its serpentine path above them, leading to the promenade deck at the top. There were small benches built into the sides of the stairwell from place to place. They used to leave this place open all the time, way back when, before a little boy fell and died. And then they closed it and only opened it under a lot of supervision a couple of times a year. People used to come up here and then picnic at the park and walk up here to take the air. I mean, it's pretty cool. What do you see? Brady was excited to share this experience with Kaylee, like a boy wandering free at the fair for the first time with a friend. Near the top of the ascent, a glass panel showed them the level of the water and the sheer circumference of the massive iron tank. Kaylee found herself drawn to the water, getting closer and closer to the glass panel, now putting her hands on the surface and then leaning against it. So much water in one place, so concentrated. So placid and cold. Brady watched her for a moment, wondering what she was thinking, but he... Brady watched her for a moment, wondering what she was thinking, but she said nothing. She seemed to be concentrating, lost in thought, but what was that? Did the water slosh towards them? What was that? Did something move in the water of the tank? No, impossible, he thought, but the closer she leaned into the window, the more the water lapped to the side towards her, like she was some kind of magnet. Brady quickly grabbed her by the waist and found that she didn't struggle against him. She was transfixed. Hey, don't do that. We don't know what that glass will hold, and if you fell in, I don't even want to think about what could happen, he protested. She withdrew and looked at him like she'd never seen him before, and slowly her memory returned and she regained her composure. Sorry, Brady. I, I don't know what came over me. The water it sounds interesting. Brady had to think about what she had just said. Water sounding interesting. What did that mean? He listened and couldn't hear a thing except for the reverberations of their own movements and the voices in this artificial mountainous cistern. Perhaps all the days of imprisonment had a cumulative effect on her. Brady was nothing if he wasn't patient. Come on, he said. Wait till you see the view. We're nearly there. The door at the top of the stairwell opened to reveal a beautiful sunny early afternoon. The sense that they were suspended in the air, like ethereal spirits, immediately seized them both. They had both been in high structures before, but this one was open to the winds and the birds. The rim around the circumference was chest high, maintaining at least a modicum of safety for any casual bystander who might lose his or her balance. No one could fall off this structure without a great deal of effort. They looked out upon a strange landscape. From up here, it was obvious to anyone that Bangor and Brewer were cities set in the middle of a huge, seemingly endless forest, reminiscent of the earliest days before the advent of the Hand of Man. Usually, the majority of the city hid beneath a green plume of trees, with only the largest of structures peeking out from the canopy. The fire had taken its toll. Downtown Bangor was gone. Both the eastern and western parts of the city had taken heavy damage, but there were pockets that survived. The Bangor Mall area was untouched. Brewer, protected by the deep-flowing Penobscot River, was totally unscathed. Broadway was a cinder. Union Street and most of the houses clustered on that side of the city were also gone. Smoke still rose in pockets. Every now and then, small explosions could still be heard from oil tanks and gas lines exploding, and with no human hand to tend them, they continued to burn. The city was still in danger. Oh, my God, began Kaylee. This is what happens to cities when there aren't any more people. Well... No time like the present, Brady said, taking a long black cylinder that he had carried with him on his back and unscrewing the top. He withdrew his map and laid it out on the floor of the deck. A black sharpie in hand, he began to make adjustments to the lay of the land as pictured on the paper. Working together, they continued to remake the world. That's gone, Kaylee said as she watched Brady work. He carefully marked each section of the city as burned or safe. He paid particular attention to the green spots on the map where food and supplies had been found. As Brady began nearing the boundaries of the map, he got up often to visually check places in the distance with his binoculars. He was about to delete a depot in the distance when Kaylee said, 
No, that's still there. Brady looked up and said, I just checked. I can't see it. It must have burned down. Here, check it yourself with the binoculars. Kaylee said simply, I don't need binoculars. I can see it perfectly well. See, it's still there. It's kind of hidden behind some trees, but it's still there. Brady looked without the binoculars, but it was simply too far. And then he tried again with the binoculars. Sure enough, the building he was about to cross off the map that held at least a year's worth of canned food was, in fact, still standing. She had seen it with her naked eye. Brady lowered the binoculars and slowly turned his head to look at her. Did you see it? she asked. Yes, he said in a low tone. But the question is, how did you see it? Kaylee wondered silently at her own private thoughts. If he could speak with books and she could see things with the eye of an eagle, something besides the world had changed. She heard water speaking to her. No, that wasn't right. She heard water chanting to her, singing to her, like a chorus of worshippers. Brady had changed, but so had she. Somehow their powers of perception were growing to include new characteristics, and that frightened her, because deep down... She also felt strangely excited about it. Brady, how did it feel when you first heard the general speak? Did it make you feel like a freak? Brady kept surveying the green sword as far as his eyes could see and answered, Yep, definitely freak time in Strangerville, but you know what? It didn't take long before it seemed perfectly normal. I think books and statues were always able to speak. What? No way. It's definitely new. Books and statues could never speak, she said resolutely. Brady turned from surveying his new realm to look her straight in the eye. Well, how do you know? Was it because they never spoke to you? End of chapter.